Welcome to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. This is Jennifer Milner, your guest co-host. Dr. Bluestein and I are so thrilled to have Dr. Joel Wells as our guest today. Dr. Wells is an assistant professor in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery and a comprehensive hip surgeon at UT Southwestern. He sees patients at the Sports Medicine Clinic at Richardson Plano and is also the medical director for Miles for Hips, an organization that supports the International Hip Dysplasia Institute. Dr. Wells had two wishes growing up, to play professional baseball and attend Tulane University School of Medicine. He was drafted by the New York Mets his senior year at Abilene Christian University and also accepted to Tulane. Being more excited about being accepted to Tulane, he made the decision to choose medical school over baseball. Dr. Wells followed his passion and earned his medical degree at Tulane University, followed by an internship in surgery at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and a residency in orthopedic surgery at Harvard Orthopedics and Massachusetts General Hospital. He then received advanced training in joint preservation, resurfacing, and reconstructive surgery through a fellowship at Washington University in St. Louis. In recent years, Dr. Wells has received numerous honors and awards, most recently being selected as the Young Alumnus of the Year for Abilene Christian University. Dr. Wells, hello, and welcome to Bendy Bodies. Hello, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you very much. We are so glad to have you here today because we know that hip issues are very common in dancers with hypermobility. But first, I would love to know what got you to this point, to being the specialist? What led you to where you are today? Well, thank you, Jen and, uh, and Linda, so much for this, uh, this opportunity. And uh, of course, uh, um, and Jen, you kind of outlined it very nicely in that uh, I specialize in hips and, you know, how, how did I come to uh, being uh, loving hips and wanting to help patients with hip disorders? Well, uh, you outlined it nicely that I was an athlete. You know, uh, I grew up uh, being very athletic and uh, um, training to be the best at things. And uh, um, as, as I went through my training, I, I loved the anatomy of the hip. I, I loved the pathology and I also loved the patients that had hip pathology. And that's why I chose um, hip surgery. But uh, also the big uh, portion of hip surgery is also uh, non-operative uh, care for patients with hip disorders. And I think that's very important. But I love the cradle to grave hip issues from patients with uh, pediatric hips as well as sports hips and dancers hips and everything that can go wrong with the hips and also the elderly. And so I, I like being able to focus on one joint because it is so complex and we are still learning about the hip. Absolutely. So tell us a little bit about what you do specifically and how that's different than um, what a typical hip doctor might do. So uh, historically, uh, uh, most orthopedic surgeons are somewhat uh, sports-focused, pediatric-focused, or joint replacement-focused. And I, I think uh, a newer uh, upcoming in orthopedics is uh, a, a uh, joint-specific-focused uh, specialty. And what I do in orthopedics, I actually have clinic tomorrow at Texas Scottish Rite. I do... Um, patients that are uh, younger with hip pathologies before they need a hip replacement. And then I go to everything that's in between. And so knowing what can go wrong with the hip and trying to preserve it is very important. And so what's near and dear to my heart is trying to prevent hip pathology before it presents with arthritis. And so mm. of course, arthritis, once we know that a patient has uh, in stage uh, arthritis, the treatment is a total hip. But my goal is trying to prevent that. And I think it's very important to understand that a lot of pathologies that lead to arthritis can be prevented because there's a mechanical reason why hips wear out. That makes a lot of sense. Now, having been a dancer and having gone through my dance career in the, the 90s and um, into the early 2000s, I think the first time that I heard the phrase a hip preservationist was meeting you and talking to you about it. So it seems like a relatively new approach in the field. Is that fair to say? It's, it's extremely new. And it's, it's, it's very new to actually be so kind of super specialized. 
Mm. Uh, in medical school, you, you kind of learn a little bit about everything. And then when you're learning about that, you, you feel like you know a lot about everything. But once you learn about something so specific, you understand how little you knew. And I think that's very important in the hip and that we know really so little about hip preservation. Um, we know certain factors and certain uh, deformities that will lead to arthritis, but can we really preserve a hip is still being uh, investigated. Mm. And so this, all this began with uh, uh, Dr. Gantz and his PAO and then also his surgical hip dislocation. As we learn more about the anatomy of the hip and the blood supply of the hip, we can treat the, these, these deformities and hopefully preserve them. That's so interesting. So rather than trying to improve the hip replacements down the line, we're trying to get to the point where we don't even need the hip replacements. Well, well yes, that's the, that's the ultimate goal. And that's something I'm, I'm fighting uh, every single day, especially with industry, because uh, with industry, uh, hip replacements are, are, are very important, right? They're a big portion of industry, especially in orthopedics. And uh, joint replacements are a big part of basically revenue for certain companies and preserving a hip kind of prevents that. And in a way (laughs) you are going against mainstream advice, trying to preserve something. Yeah, I could see that. I could see how that would be different or maybe not the first approach that some people would want to take. Um, And I've also seen, you know, with the hips and sort of the, the trends with it, I mean, labral tears were not even an issue that people would deal with 20 years ago. So even that in itself has come so far. It used to be, from my point of view, just as a dancer, it used to be a much bigger, bigger idea of, well, it's either this or it's this. And now there are so many smaller things in between that can be done that's not quite so drastic and not quite so big. Um, And now moving to what you're hoping for, which is not even needing to do anything because we're working preemptively on it. I love that idea. Exactly. And I think that's the most important part, having a um, basically a focused team for, for these dancers or whomever uh, for their hip pathology. And I'm just one piece of the puzzle, but I'm, I'm, I'm also a, an important piece of the puzzle in order to guide them in the right direction, just like you, Jen. We, we work together. Yes, absolutely. Now, you do see a fair number of dancers, um, and they do have a a high rate of hip dysplasia. Can you explain first to our listeners what hip dysplasia is and why there is a higher prevalence amongst dancers? Yeah, and so, you know, hip dysplasia is something I love, and I have um, basically uh, um, wanted to my research and everything that I I do is is basically uh, for hip dysplasia and hip impingement. Why is that? Well, number one, because those two pathologies, whether it's femoral impingement or hip dysplasia, are the number one reasons that we have hip pain and lead, lead to arthritis. And so hip, hip dysplasia, in a nutshell, is basically a shallower hip socket. I, I know uh, some of our listeners or, or someone will, will say, hey, well, my German shepherd or golden retriever had hip dysplasia. <laughs> it's, it's actually very similar because the, these, uh, these breeds have a genetic predisposition to a shallower hip socket. And what does that do? It means it's something so simple having a shallower hip socket. But what does it do? It, it leads to aberrant pathomechanics to the hip, and it can lead to early degeneration. Why? Because the mechanics of the hip are off and the hip joint is a pure ball and socket joint. And if it's not a ball or a socket, then the cartilage is at a disadvantage because of mechanics. And so it's a properly formed socket. And so hip dysplasia in a nutshell is a shallower hip socket. And there are a lot of varieties that, you know, that, um, that, that I study and everything, but uh, basically when you have a, a misshapen femoral socket, it can lead to earlier arthritis because of the mechanics. Okay. And so why do you see that more in dancers? Well, hip, so the, the hip range of motion, it's, I like to use the term Goldilocks. It's kind of like the perfect, um, perfect scenario. If you have too little coverage, then you have excessive motion because you have an excess motion before you impinge on the other side of the joint. Think of a ball and socket joint, like a baseball and a glove. If you have a very shallow baseball glove, such as a catcher's mitt, 
you have more area to catch that ball. Whereas if you have a, 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 a outfielder's glove, it's a, there's a lot of room in that you can easily hit on that leather. The similar uh, aspect to the hip. And so the hip joint, if you have a very shallow socket, you have much more range of motion before one bone, the femur bone, hits against the acetabulum bone. And this can lead to impingement. Well, dancers need excessive motion because it's an, it's an amazing sport that requires that. And patients with hip dysplasia often have excessive motion because that's what their anatomy will allow them to do. I see. So it sounds like you're saying that hip dysplasia in general can lend itself to a more aesthetically pleasing dancer, yes? It, it can. It can lead to a more aesthetically pleasing dancer that is able to do things that other dancers cannot. Yes, but at okay. the same time, is, is that a, a, a healthy hip or is that a hip <laughs> that will stay pain-free? That's another question. Right. So we see it more commonly in dancers because uh, it contributes to the aesthetic of dance, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be healthier or have a longer career because of that. Exactly. Yes. yes. Perfect. Do you see more hypermobility in your dance patients, like hypermobility in general in your dance patients than in the general population? Well, so that's a great question, Jen. And so to be honest with you, I probably see more hypermobile patients in, with hip pathology, not just dancers and all hip pathology. Oh, interesting. And, and, and so I, I definitely think that dancers um, have a subgroup of hypermobility, uh, which is, is somewhat uh, helpful at the one time, but it's kind of a balance. Uh, we talked about that kind of Goldilocks, but um, I definitely see a, a, a lot of hypermobile patients. And so every single patient I see you know, I am testing for hypermobility. Interesting. So it seems that the percentage of hypermobile people you see is probably higher than the percentage of hypermobile people in the general population. I always completely agree with that. And that, that's something that uh, needs to be studied, which I am, because uh, I, I am truly fascinated about it. Oh, that's so interesting. I can't wait to see what you find out. So how does hypermobility change how you might approach an issue? Yeah, and so the thing is, um, all too often, we, we get, uh, especially as orthopedic surgeons or any provider, we get focused on one area, uh, one pathology. And so um, I, I see a lot of patients that are sent to me that uh, have what, quote unquote, uh, normal radiographs, but their, their hips, for, for the most part, are unstable, in my opinion, because of their hypermobility. No one really took the time to, to check, you know, how they are actually hypermobile, their bait and score. Mm -hmm. And a, a patient, especially a dancer that is having hip discomfort that has normal radiographs should always be screened for hypermobility. And do you see a fair amount of people with um, hypermobility that goes more extreme, like to uh, connective tissue disorders like EDS or Marfan or that sort of thing? I do. I, I do. And I have a close relationship with uh, uh, genetics here at UT Southwestern as well as my, uh, um, my, my mother-in-law is a geneticist. And we, have, we both have a, a very uh, keen uh, um, interest in hypermobile patients because, um, because what's unique about joints, whether it's the shoulder or the hip or the knee, is that uh, excessive motion in a joint causes pain despite radiographic evidence of, of any, any, anything wrong with that. And that's because of, of excessive motion. Mm -hmm. And so soft tissue and ligamentous laxity is, a, is a, very, uh, a very important part of joint health. And so I know that you are a surgeon, <laughs> but I also know from working with you that you do not always jump to surgery as the first solution. Um, so what informs your cautious approach and what has brought you to that point? Well, I, everything I do, Jen, I, I try to be very evidence-based, right? And so every, my, my goal is, a, is my research is looking at outcomes, right? And so um, there, there are things that I, I know when I see uh, radiographically or an exam that I know will definitely lead to some degeneration or, or some uh, significant pathology that 
I can correct. Um, if I see one of those, then, then of course I let the patient and their, their family know. But there are a lot of things that are somewhat in between that we're not fully sure. Like these patients are symptomatic at an early age, yet the long-term studies that we know do not necessarily mean that they're going to end up with end-stage arthritis or significant pathology that, that at this stage I can treat. And so in my heart, I have a, I have a very hard time putting through a patient uh, through a surgery that um, may help but may not help. And so mm -hmm. I, I definitely think that uh, understanding a patient's hip pathology, whether it be treating them surgically or non-surgically, is the most important. And so uh, I think the most important part of my job is educating patients about their hip, their hip mechanics, their pathology, their kinematics, and what can go wrong if we don't correct these. Yes. Well, and you said earlier um, that there's so much about the hip that we still don't know. And I have seen so many hip surgeries that have complications further down the line with dancers with hypermobility. You know, we have scarring issues. The way we, the way we regrow <laughs> can be different. And so there are so many complications that you don't necessarily anticipate just from injections or doing surgeries, you try to fix one thing and then it ends up causing complications with another. Um, and so I would think that that would also be part of the decision-making process of, do we want to start a chain reaction here if we don't have to? You know, you, you couldn't have said it better. That, that, is, that is phenomenal because um, every, you know, every action has a reaction. And whether it's a, whether it's a simple intervention as an injection which is not benign to a surgical intervention, which is, which is ex exceptionally not benign. Right. Um, they can have these downstream effects that these, especially these patients that I see that are very young, is that you don't want to start them on the kind of downward spiral to, you know, having chronic pain or other issues just because of this initial inciting event. And so that's why I think number one is starting with uh, education with these patients, because every, you know, every treatment that we do is, is, uh, is important yet has some, uh, some risk. And so at the same time, we have to let patients and their families know what we're treating and it should be a shared decision-making process. Absolutely. And trying to look further than, being well enough to do this nutcracker, but trying to see what we can do to do the next seven nutcrackers. Exactly. Yes. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, dancing is such a phenomenal sport and, and I, and I love it. And I, I love the patients because they are, um, you know, dancers, it, 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 they are true athletes in my opinion and uh, almost to a fault. And so, um, helping these patients understand that getting them through not just the, like you said, the first nutcracker, but my goal is to have them having a long uh, a professional uh, a professional career is the most important, not just getting them to the next one. Absolutely. That's fantastic. So it's post-dance also, right, that we want to make sure that people can be as functional as they, as they possibly can be. And so, uh, Dr. Wells, you are a hip specialist as opposed to a general orthopedic surgeon. And what sort of things would be make a, a dancer seek out a specialist, you know, that's doing um, more specific things like you are? Yeah. And so, um, basically, um, as we're becoming so advanced with medicine, we're becoming a, a, a nation of specialists. And I think that is really important. But at the same time, we can't lose our, um, our you know, our generalists to, to be kind of the, the go-to for, uh, for certain things. Um, for me, I, 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 you know, I honestly, I see the majority of my patients. I, of course, I'm happy to see anyone, but I see almost all hip, any hip pathology. And so the, you know, 95% of the patients I see uh, have hip pathology. And I think that's really important because um, seeing, a, seeing a generalist, um, yes, uh, they can triage things, but uh, know, knowing the nuances is very difficult. And, and, uh, and as I teach residents and medical students, um, I, I don't expect them to know the nuances. This is something that you need to, to learn and it takes time. And so having a generalist, whether it's a hip preservation specialist or a hip specialist or a shoulder specialist, 
is really important when it comes to our super specialized patients. And are there ways that people can find some a hip preservation specialist like like yourself if they're not in your area or are not able to travel to come see you? A lot of people have difficulty sitting when they have you know, when they start developing problems with their hips and that kind of thing. So um, is there, do you have any suggestions for how somebody could find someone that would have, you know, a mindset at least, at least on the same track as yours? Cause I, I think that's a fantastic approach to, you know, be not thinking surgery as, as an earlier step than is absolutely necessary. Linda, that's phenomenal. That, that's the kind of, besides hip dysplasia, that's my, my other um, very important thing that I, that I, I want to help with and that, um, there, there are a few kind of go-to places that we have, uh, whether it's uh, International Hip Dysplasia Institute or, uh, you know, you know the, the um, internet is really important in, in finding physicians. And I think it's, it has a, a great wealth of knowledge. At the same time, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And so I, I think uh, it's very important that as us as physicians, Really, my goal is to show what outcomes and kind of what research is important. That should be publicly noted. And so something that's near and dear to me is actually publishing uh, live uh, outcomes on whether it's social media or on your web page on um, treatment options. That's caught with often some controversy and, and also some, uh, um, some debate. I definitely think when we look for a restaurant to eat at or a, uh, a, a mechanic, um, there are a lot of options on the internet to find uh, ratings and things like that. Currently, ratings of physicians or outcomes and what they do is, is very oblivious and it's very difficult for patients. And so I think having a go-to website, whether it's an un, it should be an unbiased website because med- medical knowledge is very different that the patients can go to to help find help wherever their uh, their provider may be. And that's something that, uh, that I am working on currently. That's really fabulous. I think you said that really well, that we can get so much information before we go to a restaurant. Now, obviously, we have to take any, any of these things with a grain of salt, but something as, as critically important, I have patients that have, are young and have had already multiple hip surgeries and they're not doing well. I mean, if they're coming to see me for pain management, they're probably not doing well. And maybe they did need the surgeries, but it seems like in a number of cases that they perhaps could have maybe had a different outcome at least, you know, so far. So um, I'm, I'm, if that was, you know, not just, not just uh, on social media or, or, you know, opinion, but if that actual outcome, how that patient was, was, uh, uh, objectively doing was published and easily knowledgeable, then I definitely think patients would benefit. And that is not currently being done basically anywhere, in my opinion. Right, right. Absolutely. I mean, you know, if we had more of a value-based uh, medical system where you looked at the outcomes relative to the cost, right, that would be, I know that um, Dr. Michael Porter talks about this a lot, that whether it's a a center of excellence for headaches or hips or anything else, that if you look at outcomes and what did it cost to get that outcome, that would be such a great way to actually um, do our healthcare. But that's unfortunately not how we're doing it right now. Um, It's not even cost, right? And so like, it's, I I think more on outcome. And so cost can be skewed because um, you can make things cheaper and you can make uh, patients possibly possibly do better uh, short term. But, uh, you know, I hate to use the baseball analogy. Of course, I was a baseball player, but like, you know, I, I did not get a scholarship or paid to strike out. Right. But healthcare is very different. I get paid. Honestly, I, I get paid and rewarded to operate no matter right. what. Outcome. Right. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so I, I think that that needs to change and that, uh, you know, no one, no one gets paid to about, a, 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 you know, a hundred uh, you get paid to bat over 300 and do well. And so we need to define what our outcomes are in, in order to provide patients a uh, better service. Definitely. I l- love that. And, and within the dance world, have you seen changes that make you concerned? And are there changes that you would like to see happen in the dance world? 
Yeah. And so, um, you know, I, I think the biggest thing is that in, in the, in the dance world, especially in hip pathology is that we now can, um, safely get to the hip. And when I say safely, I mean, not destroy, you know, neuro, neurovascular structures, but it doesn't mean patients do well. And I, and I see it, um, a lot more, um, patients getting scoped early on very quickly, mm-hmm. whether their hip or other joints are being operated on just because they, they have a possible pathology, but it may not be their underlying um, diagnosis. And so in the hip world, I, I see a lot of patients um, basically going into surgery too quickly, in my opinion, without really exhausting, without really that knowledge of their, of their uh, joint pathology. That, that makes sense. And and what advice would you give to hypermobile dancers as they try to stay healthy in their own career? You know, that's, I, I, I love that question. And, um, you know, the advice I would give is one, um, I, I want every single one of my patients to continue to dance if they can, right? But um, at the same time, I would, I would never tell them to one, stop dancing, but Two, understanding their hip and, and, and understanding their joints and trying to uh, be a, a better, um, to, to strengthen their hips in order to be a better dancer or to strengthen their joints. And so um, uh, dancing is so much more uh, strength as it is a range of motion. And so these patients often kind of lack the, uh, the joint stabilizing uh, uh, mechanics of their hip or their shoulders or other joints. And so focusing on strengthening, not so much of their range of motion is very important in a balance of that. Yeah, yeah, that <laughs> I know Jen and I both definitely agree. And it's so hard because they, they, they want the range. They, you know, they see things on social media and they, on, you know, real quote unquote reality TV, right? It's, it's not really reality, but um, they, they see these things and they think, I want to be able to do that. Whether, I mean, they may be were hypermobile, they might be hypomobile, right? So they might have actually less range, but they're going to ca- cause some kind of, you know, injury to themselves because they see other people doing things and they're going to, they try to do it. So it can definitely be challenging. Yes. Yes. At the same time, but you know, I was an athlete and pushing yourself to the max is, is part of being an athlete. And that's, that's why I love dancers, but also at the same time, you, you know, you have a coach, right. And you have a team to help you get there in a, in a safe way. Yes. And, and I would add also that one of the things I like about you and, and the way that you practice is that you will consistently send the dancers with the hip issues back to their coaches, back to their teachers to do private work to fix their technique and to have them strip it down, step back and make sure that what they're doing, they're doing right so that they're strengthening correctly and working in a really safe range. Um, and hearing hearing it from me to tell them to slow down is one thing, but hearing it from their doctor <laughs> saying, hey, let's step back and let's do this and let's really work on the basics. And then, you know, two months from now, it's going to be so much better um, is so important, and that I value that that a doctor will do that and say that to them. Yeah, Jen, and that, that's the that's so important, right? And so I, I I'm just one orthopedic surgeon, right, in a in a big uh, metropolitan city, and so when I have patients that fly in to see me and from all over DFW or elsewhere, they, you know, you you don't you can't you discuss with the therapist right off there, but you know what I like to do? I, I like to give the therapist my email, my cell phone, so we can at least, you know, talk because it is a team effort. Absolutely. And I, I, that's so important. I totally agree. (laughs) Because you can't just write a script saying hip dysplasia or hip impingement and expect really everyone to be on the same page. It just doesn't work like that. Right. Uh, And, and patient, uh, you know, specifics just doesn't work like that. And so every patient is different. And then I really feel like every patient um, especially these complex hip patients and just dancers need need focused care, and the only way you can do that is really talking one on one. That's that's fabulous. I love that you that you share your email address with them. That's that's fantastic. And you just mentioned impingement again, and I thought if you could maybe um, go over. Uh, we we talked about dysplasia. We've met, you've mentioned impingement, I think. Um, but if you could maybe just explain again about um, impingement, labral tears, arthritis, just a little bit so people 
understand what some of these different things are because maybe they've heard these things in their doctor's office and the doctor has either said, let's do an injection, let's do surgery. Um, you know, if you could maybe explain what some of those things are and um, how people might be able to judge, uh, in addition to what you said about the looking at, does their doctor produce um, information about outcomes either on social media or in their office, even that they can ask, Hey, do you have any data that you, that you can share? Can you just explain a little bit more about those things? Uh, definitely Linda. And thank you. And so we'll start with, with hip impingement. And so um, to be honest, as us orthopedic surgeons, uh, we, we, we are very, we're very simple uh, men and uh, men and women. And so um, hip impingement basically means that um, the, the hip joint, uh, either the femur or the acetabulum, is impinging or touching one another. And so I, I think that to, term uh, often gets used too loosely because even hip dysplasia patients can impinge on certain ranges of motion, right? And so if you're, a, if you're able to do certain motion activities um, and, and splits, you can technically impinge, right? But it does sure. not that you have hip impingement. And so if hip impingement is usually uh, used as femoral acetabular impingement, meaning the femur and the acetabulum or the socket side is touching one another. But the thing is, is that, uh, that, uh, that, that touching one another can cause damage. And you mentioned labral tears. Well, the labrum is basically a, a circle around the acetabulum. It's, a, it's basically a ring that is lining the acetabulum. It's an extension of the acetabular cartilage. And it's, it, it, it serves as a bumper or, or a, a, a gasket uh, and kind of a, a washer around the hip. And what that does is if you impinge over time, repetitive impingement, hitting one bone against the other can cause, um, uh, can cause tears um, or, or, or pain because of that impingement. And so just because uh, you have a labral tear does not mean you have hip impingement. And just because you are impinging does not mean you have femoral have impingement. And so it's much more complex, but that, that those are the kind of the simple, simple ways to, to look at it is that one bone is hitting in against the other. And a labral tear is that a portion of the cartilage that surrounds the socket side of the acetabulum um, is, uh, is torn or frayed or worn out because of some process that's causing hip pain. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I guess one thing that I'm wondering is in your practice over this, you know, I have whatever time period that you want to pick, do you feel like you're seeing more injuries in, in dancers and maybe even other athletes as people are pushing themselves harder, their dancers are doing more overstretching, over splits, um, you know, things like this. Without a doubt. And, uh, um, and so um, I, I'll, I'll use, I, I had clinic today and, and I believe I had, uh, um, I, I saw 28 hips. And so I, I, I like I said, I, I purely exclusively see hips. And of that 28 hips, almost half of them, they were not dancers necessarily, but they were from either yoga or other um, somewhat um, highly kind of static stretching activities. And uh, um, the, the thing is, is that uh, every hip is unique to that patient. And that's one reason why I love the hip so much, because hip range of motion is inherent to each patient. It, it, there's a lot of factors that go into hip range of motion. It's not just soft tissue. It's just not stretching. It is bony morphology. It's rotation. It's uh, pelvic tilt and obliquity. All that factors into motion. And so if one person is trying to mimic another person that, you know, they may not be able to reach, then they can cause damage to the soft tissue structures in and around the hip. And so to answer your question, people are taught that uh, from the uh, little age when they're in elementary school, that stretching is the most important part. Well, the hip is very unique. It's very different than the knee or the elbow or the wrist. It's a constrained ball and socket joint. So what my dancers would say to you <laughs> in all their 10 and 12 and 14-year-old wisdom is um, if they 
maybe not my dancers because they know better now, but what, what a lot of dancers would say, if they want to sit in the hyper splits or the over splits and put their bottom on the floor and put their feet up on a chair, one foot in front and one foot behind up on chairs and really sit in that over split, why is that bothering the hip when they're stretching their hamstrings? <laughs> what is that what does that stretch have to do with their hips is what they would like to know exactly and so that's why you know i i think uh, i i can i can talk to patients till i'm blue in the face but if i show them a model if i show them their x-rays then i i, I think they really understand and so that's why um the the majority of what i do daily is educating patients mm-hmm. about their hips and that's what I love, right? And, and, and I, it never gets old. And I love it so much. And so it's really showing these patients that do that what their hip is doing. And, you know, you, I, you can tell them that, but if, unless you show them, they don't understand. And so mm-hmm. um, I, I really think that uh, uh, showing them a model. And so a lot of these patients that have really complex hips, I always – always get advanced imaging and and we have a great protocol at UT Southwestern that we've developed a a low dose CT scan because all these patients are actually very, very young and, you know, radiographs can be, um, can, can be harmful throughout their life. Well, low dose CT scan, that's just equivalent to a few x-rays can show them a perfect model of their hip and also help them understand what is going wrong. Interesting. So are you, are you saying that you're doing these CT scans when they are actually um, doing various different positionings rather than just, you know, for most of us, when we've had a CT or an MRI, we're, we're laying, you know, supine, we're like laying on our back and we're in a fairly neutral position. Oh man, Linda, you just brought up a huge topic that I love. And so (laughs) four four dimensional CT scans, uh, we're working on that, but and so we, we actually, uh, um, you know, I have a grant research money and everything that we're, I'm actually working closely with the engineers and the, the gate uh, um, uh, uh, labs at UT Dallas. And we are actually studying these hips with hip impingement and dysplasia and getting their actually joint mechanics. Because the problem, what you just brought up is that his CT scan, you're laying down in a CT scanner, right? It doesn't show functional motion. But right. It, but if you can take a patient with their actual uh, f- uh, physical range of motion, their clinical range of motion, their actual gait data, and then also their advanced imaging, and you can mesh that all together, you could have a four-dimensional imaging to actually show them how their hip is working and what's wrong with it. Mm. And so, yes, that is, a, uh, that is currently underway, and it is, it is being done a, a, as we speak at UT Southwestern. Wow. That's really fabulous. I mean, whether people are hypermobile or not, it's so much better if you can get a much more complete picture like that. Yeah, it, it's so yeah. much better to get a complete picture, but also it's so much better to understand one's hip pathology because these patients are not just uh, labral tears. They're not just dysplastic patients. They're much more than that. And understanding their four-dimensional aspects of their hip is the, the best way to fully treat them. Definitely. And, and in addition to that, getting edu- the education and, and expl- you know, explaining, showing them this four-dimensional, I mean, that all sounds fantastic. What else can we do as individuals to improve joint health and help to preserve our own hips? <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> pres- that, that is joint preservation. It doesn't have to be the shoulder. It doesn't have to be the hip or the knee, but joint preservation. And honestly, the the number one thing you can do for a joint is move it, okay? And so understanding the the certain motions of the hip is important, but a joint in motion stays in motion. And so it's a fine balance, right? And so patients often, um, once they stop an activity or they they graduate from high school to college, they, they may actually become less active. And then their joints actually end up hurting more because it's not moving. And so number one, for for a healthy joint, a joint in motion stays in motion. And then number two, understanding the proper motions and mechanics of that joint is number two. And so I I think uh, I I never, um, I, I, I try to never limit any of my patients into doing things that they 
they love to do. And so that's my goal every single day is showing up to work, trying to help patients achieve what they consider their goal in life or their quality of life. And that answer means something different to everyone. And it mm. starts with number one, joint motion. Um, there are some supplements and things that we're studying. Uh, th there are some okay randomized uh, uh, trials that are okay uh, for joint health. But the thing is with the hip, and I, I know this is a big on the, the hip, is that the, the thing, whether it's stem cells or uh, supplements, the problem with the hip and what's what I love about the hip is that it's usually mechanical, right? It's not necessarily biologic. There are some things mm -hmm. that I see that are biologic that cause pathology, but the majority of the things are not. It's mechanical. And so it's understanding the mechanics of your hip. And, you know, if they're significantly, um, if, if they're significantly um, different from the normal population, correcting those mechanics, then that can, that can provide the better joint health. Absolutely. And I will say also, I was speaking to Lisa Howell about hips. She's a physiotherapist from Australia and a large, uh, uh, she plays a large role in the dance medicine world as well. And she and I were talking about hips specifically and dancers struggling with turnout and rotation and extension and, and all these things. And she said she had seen so many teen dancers who have had x-rays or whatever kind of imaging they've done. And they've been told, well, look at your pictures. You're never going to get more turnout. You're never going to do this. You're never going to do that. And she said nine times out of, well, 90 times out of 10, 95 times out of a hundred, let's say she, she would look at them and say, that's just not true. What we're looking at is not biological. We're looking at mechanical, just like what you just said. Yes. And there are very few x-rays or images that she would look at and categorically say, hey, we need to move in a different direction. So it's so important to know what they want and to be able to give them the tools to try to achieve that and to say, hey, let's see what, let's see what the mechanical issues might be that are going on. So I love that. I love that answer. It's, it's so, that's so true, uh, Jen. And so uh, honestly, um, you can't, you, you can never tell a patient or a dancer what they can and can't do by a static x-ray. Right. So, so many people do, but an x-ray is a two-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional object. And you can't, uh, you can't, um, you know, stomp on someone's dreams. You can't tell them that they can't do something just from a two-dimensional representation of a four-dimensional object. Mm. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> are, are there any um, guidelines that you can can give our, our listeners in terms of I'm thinking about labral tears specifically. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is there is there anything in terms of like you know obviously we have the caveat that this is this is medical information not advice you know obviously we're speaking to you know whoever's listening and and, and cannot provide individual information but are there any in terms of like location of the labral tear or how much of the labor might be torn or because i feel like that's an area of a, of a lot of confusion and when they get a recommendation that yeah we should go in and clean up this torn labrum um you know if you can provide any information more about that that would be fabulous yeah linda and so so number one i think if, if anyone is diagnosed with a quote-unquote labral tear that is young in a dancer and that wants to continue to dance, I, I would recommend number one, and you know, this uh, is in my practice and, and I don't think anyone would, um, would actually argue this, is that they should see a hip specific physician, um, whether it's a physical medicine and rehab, orthopedic surgeon, um, or someone that specializes in hips. And so that's number one. I think they should get to someone that understands hips and um, can, can honestly triage them as necessary Yes, because um, patients that are young, normal patients, um, you know, um, in our age groups that we are talking about should not have labral tears in my opinion. And, and so just because they maybe have radiographic evidence or a, a radiologist read a labral tear may mean they may not even have a labral tear, to be honest with you. They may not have the proper imaging to diagnose that. And then two, if they do, um, it is best to see a specialist. And so I don't think anyone would argue that. Um, with regards to, uh, um, you know, what should be done with the, the labral tear, 
um, or uh, you know after that. Um, it, it is much more complex than that, and so that's why I really think that uh, if someone recommends, hey, you need to have a surgery for this labral tear, it is it is never bad to have a second opinion. And mm-hmm. I sure yes. Even as a surgeon, I I often think it is good for patients because that's part of the educational process, right? Um, Having patients understand their pathology and see uh, providers that can kind of helpfully help educate them. And so I would also recommend they seek a second opinion if someone recommends surgery. And then lastly, uh, so what are what are some guidelines for for labral tears and things like that? And so. There, there are some guidelines currently for femoral acetabular impingement, but I'll, I'll tell you that these are, these are uh, I don't know if you've read many guideline uh, um, studies and things like that. These are very basic. Why are they basic? Because mm-hmm. I don't know if you've ever sat on a, on a panel trying to create guidelines. <laughs> well, guidelines are very difficult because we, we always stratify things according to the current literature and what kind right. of in space we have. And so the beginning of this talk, we talked about, you know, this is all fairly new. And so we do not have, you know, level one evidence uh, to support a lot of the things we do. And that's why I think seeing uh, multiple opinions is important, but also seeing a specialist that only deals in with their hip pathology is, is very important. And so um, to, to answer your question and not to, uh, to kind of sidestep it, I think number one, um, you should see a hip specialist. Uh, number two, you should seek a second opinion or even a third opinion. And then lastly, um, the, the current uh, guidelines, although they're great for um, standard femoral thyroid impingement, they may not pertain to, uh, to dancers and other kind of subspecialty populations. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's great. And what are some practical steps that um, hypermobile dancers can take to increase the longevity of their career? So, you know, I I think number one is listening to your hip and listening to your body. (laughs) And and so, you know, when when things start, you start feeling something that, you know, I, I think it's best to be seen sooner than later. Okay, and so um, I, I think that's very important in that uh, you don't want to be seeing someone after they've been having pain for four years and now they can't dance and then they want to get back to dancing. I think seeing those patients at, you know, four years previously is the most important because I think that's where the management, that's where the changes can occur. Okay, that makes sense. And and for for just people in general who are interested in more information about hip preservation, maybe they've had surgery, maybe they haven't had surgery. Uh, are there, do you have any other advice that, um, that you would give those people? And so, yes. And so I'm, I'm actually working, working on, uh, I'm a medical director for miles for hips right now. And I've been uh, blessed with this opportunity. And my goal for that is actually to provide unbiased educational area for hip pathology. And so uh, there, are, there are a lot of resources out there. Uh, but number one, I, I think seeing a hip specialist is very important if you're having a hip, a hip pain. And then also uh, working on uh, uh, International Hip Dysplasia Institute as well as Miles for Hips, having a safe place for patients to go that is unbiased. And so social media is phenomenal uh, for, for um, um, for some news and things, but uh, sometimes it comes with, uh, with a bias. And so uh, my goal with Miles for Hips um, online is to help provide an unbiased, safe opinion uh, for patients that they can seek out, um, whether it's a, um, a surgeon, whether it's a, a provider or information um, about their hip. Fabulous. And anybody can go to the Miles for Hips and uh, we'll have we'll have a link on the Bendy Bodies website, but anybody can can join or participate in those conversations. Anyone, yes, anyone's welcome to uh, to join, and uh, um, we, it, it is building, and it's definitely going to be a, a great a great thing. But uh, um, the the mission, in my opinion, is providing good education for patients with hip pain. Period, and so um, an unbiased, uh, safe. 
um, uh, evidence-based uh, opinion. Fantastic. Um, you have anything? Do you have anything else that you would like to add? And can you also let people know where they can find you? Yes, and so uh, um, you know, uh, I, I just want to one thank uh, uh, thank you, Jen and Linda, for this uh, amazing opportunity, and that uh, um, this is uh, um, near and dear to my heart, and what I wake up every morning wanting to help, and uh, um, and, and I love uh, uh, patients uh, with hip pathology, especially dancers, because uh, uh, because it is a true sport, and I and I and I want to help, but to uh, um, you know, you, you can find me, of course, you can Google, Google me, Joel Wells, uh, MD. Um, I, I'm very reachable, um, you know, uh, uh, anytime. And uh, you can find me on social media or my webpage uh, um, at UT Southwestern. And then also Miles for Hips is a great resource. Uh, um, it, it's, uh, it's a uh, collaboration of uh, um, phenomenal people uh, that uh, just have uh, a goal of helping patients with hip pathology. Uh, and that's uh, just miles for hips. And then um, um, lastly, you know, uh, thank you guys so much again for this opportunity. Oh, we Absolutely. are so grateful for you being, <laughs> being here and the work that you are doing and um, being willing to speak with us. It's, it's absolutely fabulous. And just so everybody knows, Miles for Hips is the number four. So it's Miles, M-I-L-E-S, and then the number four, Hips. And we will have links in the, in the show notes. So everyone will be able to um, find you to, to get more information because this is such a critically important topic, especially because it affects so many young people. Yes, and, and I want to say that all this for Miles for Hips and everything is completely voluntary, right? I, I am the medical director, um, and everyone that's on the board uh, just only does it because, uh, because they want to help, right? And we, we have no, no uh, financial incentive, and I think that's really important uh, when, when you come to an unbiased opinion. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that makes perfect sense. So, well, well, thank you so much for, for coming on today, Dr. Wells. And uh, you all have been listening to Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. And today our guest has been Joel Wells, MD, orthopedic surgeon specializing in joint preservation, resurfacing, and reconstruction. As medical director of Miles for Hips, Dr. Wells focuses on prevention, early diagnosis, and innovative treatment options to minimize the long-term impacts of hip dysplasia. Check out their website for more information and please go to bendybodies.org for links to uh, some of the research that Dr. Wells has done, Miles for Hips, and where he can be found at UT Southwestern. And this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for medical advice. Please see your own medical team prior to making any changes to your health care. The Bendy Body original music is by Andrew Savino and sound editing is by Rhett Gill. Thank you for tuning in and we will see you next time on Bendy Bodies with the Hypermobility MD. Thank you so much, Dr. Wells and our guest co-host today, Jennifer Milner. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.